This is uh, our Scum Me Up expert talk on why build a cloud center of excellence. So, um, brief introduction first. My name is Jonathan Tuliani. I'm the managing director in Europe for Ops Agility. So I have a European office and help manage our European clients. Um, I also work on the technical side on various uh, content delivery and so on for, for our training and Scum Me Up and so on. Um, I'm one of the authors of the AZ-103 exam reference if you, uh, if you use that for studying for the Azure Infrastructure Certification Track. And before joining Ops Agility, I was nearly 10 years in Microsoft and most of that was in the Azure product group. I was a program manager in the networking team. Uh, my contact details are there if you'd like to connect with me. Uh, brief background for those who don't know us, I'm sure most of you do. Opsgility is the brand we use for our instructor-led training, and this includes obviously uh, on-site instructor-led training, but in the current environment, a lot of virtual training. We provide classes around the official curriculum and for certification and also custom classes, deep dive classes, classes for business leaders, a, a whole range of, of other classes beyond that. Um, we provide interactive workshops, hackathons uh, using world-class expert instructors. So sales at opportunity.com is your contact there. And then in addition, we have our online presence, which of course is, is uh, very useful in the current COVID environment. And here we see uh, a huge range of, of in-depth expert videos uh, from our instructors covering certification tracks and much, much more besides. Um, hundreds of hands-on labs, um, including new labs that we have that are challenge-based, where you, rather than step-by-step -step instructions, are giving challenges to solve. Um, and this is all content that we generate in-house from our own experts. And there are team and individual and enterprise class subscriptions for that at skillmeup.com. And a new environment, we a new offering we have in the current environment is that we're seeing a lot of demand for for conference style training events or, or conferences of any sort, not even not even necessarily limited to training and not even limited to technology space, but conferences of all 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 manner and sizes, um, you know, going virtual in the current environment. And we have invested, uh, you know, heavily in in expanding our online presence to include a, an online conference uh, offering we call for virtual conference. Conference Manager. This lets you manage multi-day, multi-track, multi-session conferences across uh, audiences of any size, really. Uh, we can handle breakout groups, workshops, coach assignments, uh, interactive networking, expo halls, um, all different conference formats, very much designed to take the, the traditional in-person conference experience and reproduce that as best as possible in an online environment. And that, all of that is built on top of Microsoft Teams. So you can learn more about that at govirtualconference.com. The URL is at the top of the slide. Okay, and with that, let's dive into our our content for today. So uh, today we're going to talk about a cloud center of excellence. So we'll start by by describing, you know, what is a cloud center of excellence and, and what is the problem that it's designed to, to solve. And we'll look at the responsibilities that a cloud center of excellence should be given and the, the benefits that a cloud center of excellence brings. And then we'll, we'll go through some best practice guidance on how you can uh, set up your cloud center of excellence and make sure that it's on track for success. So let's start by looking at the problems we're trying to solve. So many organizations are adopting the cloud already. And when they do that, it's easy to start with one or two projects. You know, fine, you do these, these projects, small, small uh, you know, uh, on-ramps, and you, you can have a, a success with those projects. But as you start to use the cloud at more scale and you have multiple projects, things tend to get a lot more difficult. And that's where you, you're going to have multiple teams involved in the cloud, and you, you, uh, you, you're starting to hit some, some of those scale challenges that come with uh, adopting the cloud across multiple projects, multiple teams. And what can happen here is that without any kind of central coordination, you end up with these different teams going off in slightly different directions. They're using different practices, they're reusing uh, or reinventing the wheel where, where there's there's knowledge that the organization has already developed that they could have that they could ideally have reused. Uh, you know, they're not sharing as much as they could. Uh, you know, it's, it's all becoming uh, less efficient than it should be. And, and as a result, you know, obviously you're paying for that, that inefficiency and it leads to inconsistent project delivery, not just in terms of delivery schedules, but in terms of just what is delivered and what kind of designs are used, for example. People may have slightly different uh, approaches to how they set up various common components such as networking components or or identity active directory integrations and so on and this leads to this in, inconsistent environment different applications have been implemented in different ways and this can just be this just makes life very difficult to manage you know as you have staff moving between teams or you're handing things over to operations it all creates a lot 
lot of extra complexity. And that complexity, uh, at the end of the day, as well as sapping your, your efficiency, it leads to mistakes. So you're going to be looking at uh, costing mistakes. You're going to be looking at live side outages. You know, you, you, you know everything here is, is not running as smoothly and, and slickly as, as it could be. Um, also, the lack of governance around this can result in unnecessary Azure spend and unnecessary risk in terms of access control or compliance or something like this. Also, these different teams are, uh, are working independently in, in how they in how they ramp up in in the cloud skills that they need. Are they they're inefficient in how they use their training budgets, uh, procuring training separately without any coordination, for example. It's very hard for them to stay uh, on top of the latest trends in the cloud, and that makes it much harder for them to innovate. So you're always then a step behind where you might be with from your from a competitive point of view. So the inefficiency and the innovation side is, is hitting your competitiveness. So this is this is very common as people go through a huge transformation. It's important to understand the scale of, of a transformation that moving to the cloud involves, not just for IT, but beyond IT. And we'll talk about that in other sessions. But you know, when it, with a big transformation like this, it's a, it's a huge challenge. And and if it's not done in the right way, you know, all of these uh, all of these differences and, and different approaches can just uh, lead to a very muddled situation. So so that this is where the role of a cloud center of excellence comes in. So what is a cloud center of excellence? And the idea is that it's a team, generally speaking, a small team it could just be three, four, five, six individuals, um, a small team in your organization. They have a charter to support, enable and accelerate your Azure projects, you know, enabling you to move forward. And they do that not by delivering projects themselves, but they work with the actual project teams as a as a as a supporting service for those teams. So the COE doesn't directly deliver projects, but its job is to make those other teams more effective and more efficient. And it can do that in, in uh, many ways, which we'll talk about during today's today's talk. OK, so the benefits, if you have this kind of central hub that can promote reuse and promote learning and, 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 and share best practices and, and be a hub for expertise in the organization, there's a lot of benefits that can come from that. And this almost reads like the like the first slide we had a moment ago where uh, the, the problems we resolve can be solved. So you can see here that the COE, by, by being that central team, it can create consistent and repeatable customer experiences across those different delivery teams. And those teams can have higher quality uh, deliveries because they're able to reuse uh, resources that the that the central team has been able to to amass for them, so they they can deliver they can deliver much uh, better quality. There's a place for all those learnings to go and be reused, and they can also deliver much more efficiently and 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 effectively that way, faster time to market and so on, because they're not reinventing the wheel. They're not having to build everything from scratch, and this of course enables a culture change in the organisation that the, the the teams can move more quickly within the COE. You can you can promote this innovation, continuous learning, adopting new technologies, and you can stay at the, the cutting edge of what's possible there. Um, the COE team often has a governance responsibility so that your Azure usage can be can be centrally uh, governed. You know, you have that oversight. That, of course, can lead to uh, much better use of the cloud in terms of uh, security and compliance and so on, and also a much better cost optimization. And it, it means you have someone who has that ongoing cost optimization responsibility as well. There's a there's an efficiency you can have here. You can consolidate your training resources centrally, and that central team can provide training in some cases directly themselves, or they can procure training using that central budget to meet the needs of the organisation, not just individual teams. And that, of course, allows you to be much more efficient skills. And if you are, depending on the type of business that you are, wouldn't be so applicable for, for enterprises. But if you're a partner who is delivering cloud services uh, to enterprises or to other customers, then of course, the COE team can also be involved in your sales or your, or your technical pre-sales team as a supporting service for them, leading to more compelling and competitive customer proposals built on past successes and built on these best practices we've been talking about. So this is, uh, this is really the benefits that we're aiming for by aiming for a central team. Okay, so who's using a cloud center of excellence today? So this data on this slide is taken from the Flexera 2020 State of the Cloud report. This is a report that's been running for many, many years. It used to be the right scale State of the Cloud report, but it's always worth reading this report when it comes out each year. And you can see here the chart on the left is a uh, is the results from asking which which of these organizations and there's many organizations that respond to this report of various sizes. And uh, you can see there's 750 respondents. So it's just asking, you know, how many have a, a center of excellence or just a central cloud team? team 
or are planning to have such a team. And you can see a, it's it's really very a widespread approach to, to have a, some kind of central cloud team here. You can see 38% a COE or 31% a central cloud team, another 17% planning and only 14% with no plans. And that's across all respondents. And you can see that that is on, this, on the right hand chart that there's a weighting there towards the larger enterprises. Because of course the larger organization ones, they're the ones who are going to they're the ones who are going to hit the challenges that I talked about at the beginning. It's a, it's a scale where you hit the, the, those those difficulties most of all. So you can see here, they've obviously been the, the earlier adopters on this center of excellence approach. And you can see 42% with a COE team, 31% uh, a cloud team, only 10% with no plans. So uh, so it, it is really a, a widespread and, and proven approach. And as a result, there's a, there's a lot of learning and best practices that are available. And, you know, we're working with, with Microsoft and with our customers, you know, we've understood many of those uh, best practices that are that are out there for how you can build a, a COE team efficiently and effectively. So so this is a a, a, a well-trodden path, a proven approach, and and you can take advantage of the experience of others to to, to leverage what they've learned and, and, and set up your COE uh, very effectively. So let's have a little look at that. So the first thing your COE is going to need is they need a clear charter. And by that, I mean, you know, a clear mandate from the executive management as to why this team exists and how that this team and other teams should engage with each other. So it's very important that the existing delivery teams don't view this center of excellence team as some other team. It's just a tax on their time. It's something they're going to try and avoid or not bother with or undermine in any way. You know, there needs to be that strong engagement between the teams. And that's only possible with a clear executive mandate. So that's a very important part of having the COE charter. And this can be part of the, the, the larger cloud vision for the organization. It really needs to tap into that, that larger cloud vision as to why the organization is adopting the cloud and the benefits that it's hoping to bring. So within that charter, obviously, we should lay out the responsibilities of the COE versus the delivery teams. And uh, we'll talk more about that a little bit later in the talk and, and specify exactly where COE engagement is optional or mandatory. So, if, for example, if, if a delivery team is coming up with a new architecture, is it simply advisory that they do an architecture review with the, with the COE team? Or is it mandatory that they have to do a review with that team and get, that, get the COE to sign off? And that's a decision that you have to make from your organization's point of view, um, but a very important decision to make sure that everyone's clear on, on where this engagement is mandatory and where it's advisory. And if you are integrating in that way, then it makes sense to make sure this is aligned with your project management office if you have one or whatever uh, whatever other best practices you have around your project management processes and so on, so that they are they are integrating, you're integrating the role of this team into existing processes, not just layering something else on top. Um, it's important to be clear on the goals for the team and the benefits that you're expecting to achieve, because uh, it's good to be clear about those up front, so then you can, you can measure that, uh, your, your success towards that. And put in place the framework for the governance of the COE team. We're not talking about governance of subscriptions here, we're talking about the, the, the organizational governance of the COE team itself. So make clear how they're going to be held accountable for their success. And we'll talk more about that at the end of, the, at the end of today's talk. So, uh, so another idea is that often organization change happens all the time, especially with changes as big as the cloud. And it may be that, that creating the COA team is something that you that you integrate into a larger organizational change. And that can uh, that can help with with the uh, with the, the people side of a change like this and making the right people available, the the uh, the shuffling around that's required. So so think about whether this should be aligned with some larger initiative that you're working on. Okay, so what does our COE team do? So their, their first responsibility is that they are the champions of cloud in your organization. They're the ones, they help define the vision, they're, they're helping to share the vision, evangelize the vision, um, talk about cloud wins and uh, and grow cloud mindshare within the organization. So they need to be, they need to be shouting loud, they need to be the, the, the advocates of, of, of cloud. Um, Within the organization, of course, then they promote sharing and re reuse. That's a key function. So that in terms of, you know, best practices and uh, reusable artifacts. And we'll talk more about these later. But it could be templates, scripts, you know, anything that other teams can pick up and run with in order to save reinventing the wheel. That's something they can do. And the best practices, any learnings other teams have so you can avoid repeating those mistakes and falling into the same holes. Being able to centralize those learnings so that everyone can benefit is a, is a key function of the COE. 
Uh, they also provide advisory services. You know, it's, a, it's an expert group within your organization. So these are your absolute top cloud experts who can come in and disseminate that knowledge into the other organization through architecture reviews and so on, migration reviews, compliance reviews, making sure they support the rest of the organization and, and, and lift the standard of projects across the whole organization. And again, if you're a partner organization providing cloud services uh, for other, for your customers, then they can also provide these advisory services as a pre-sales function, you know, so they can support your pre-sales team so you can make better offers, uh, you know, better proposals. Um, on the training side, we've talked already about how you know you you want to make sure that you centralize that training budget so you can you can have a coordinated cloud training program from your organization. Obviously, you can reach out to learning providers like Opportunity for help with that. But the the central CoE team can by centralizing that strategy uh, piece around cloud skills can can help spend that budget efficiently and get a bigger bang for your buck and enable you to build skills at an organization level rather than just having this siloed within individual teams. And they can also play a, a useful role of building skills through fostering a technical community, setting up you know, internal brown bag type talks and, and uh, another discussion forum so that people can be sharing and learning together. So that's very much a role that the COE can take. And then lastly, governance. Uh, Azure subscriptions are a, they're a financial risk and they can be very difficult to manage. So it's very important from a security point of view, a compliance point of view, and a, and, a, and a finance point of view that good governance is in place around these subscriptions because it's very easy to have an unregulated cloud spend and for things to frankly get into a bit of a mess. So, um, so to have that, uh, you know, the, the policies, the procedures, you know, the best practices defined for how you, how you use your subscriptions, how you procure subscriptions, how, you, how they're allocated and how they're tracked, you know, that's a very important piece. And then the implementation of the policies and the access control and the security and compliance control on those subscriptions so that they are they are lined up with the organizational compliance goals and so on in mind and then to have that cost management function centralized so again these guys have the expertise around cost management and cost optimization and they're working with other teams to make sure that things are continually optimized it's very much a, a continuous process to make sure you're 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 keeping your your utilization high and your your wastage low and uh, and also uh, helping to build in the frameworks for organizational chargebacks so that you have that tight pulling uh, from the business units through to the costs that they're incurring and they, they have a they have a, a good relationship there so all the accountabilities are lined up in the right way so these are all all functions of the coe Things the COE does not do is the actual design and build of applications. That belongs in your actual development teams, in the in the project teams. The, you know, the COE team supports those teams, but it doesn't do that for you. Likewise, migration. This is not a migration team. They can support your migration team, but they don't plan or execute your migrations. And um, likewise, they're not an operations team. They don't deploy up. They don't deploy your applications. They don't do uh, your operations and monitoring and so on. You need a separate ops team for that, or you need to be in a uh, you know a deep DevOps model for that. Your COE team is not responsible for that. Um, everyone's interested in cost management, and I found some nice data in that state of the cloud report that I mentioned earlier, where they've uh, done a, a deep drill down into the not just cost management as a single responsibility, but looking at cost across a whole bunch of different different tasks within the cost management uh, sphere and looking at how that is separated out across different uh, organizations, different different, different uh, teams within an organization. And you can see here, obviously, governing those cloud IaaS and PaaS costs is a, is a primarily on the cloud team, on that central cloud team, 57%, and then infrastructure and ops is a, you know, 46 behind that. Um, and you can see, uh, you know, across the board, there's a, there's a strong engagement with the cloud team, although in some cases, primary responsibility is more commonly sitting in, in some other areas. Uh, SaaS costs, for example, uh, often elsewhere, and, and maybe software licensing costs sitting with the infrastructure structure teams but a but a significant role for the for the cloud team but i thought this is interesting so that you you get that insight that uh, um when you think about cost it, it may actually be a more a more involved conversation than you might initially think to to break down what the responsibilities are within the within that overall headline of cost management breaking down those responsibilities and and thinking about them line by line is a is a useful exercise okay so let's talk about how we how we build a central excellence team. So the first is, you know, identifying the team, the individuals that you're going to need. So you're going to need some subject matter experts, perhaps in different areas. You're going to need, uh, firstly, an overall leader for the team, but then you're going to need subject 
amount of experts around the security space for the compliance and policies and so on. Maybe uh, the data space, the infrastructure space, and the developer space. This would be a you know a, a common core team. It might be that you're not big on the data space, so you skip on that one initially. It comes in later. W whatever works for your organisation, but uh, but getting those individuals in place is a is a is a, a critical first step. Obviously, you're going to have to make sure that you that you have your COE team trained. Hopefully, you can pull on some of your existing talent and you can come in with some skilled people here or hire in some skilled people. But even then, there may be some uh, some uh, skills gaps that need to be remedied. And, and you need to, in, in particular, around the governance and security compliance space, it's important to have very strong skills in, in that particular area. Um, you then have to think about the environment that people are going to work with, you know, work out some of those best practices around subscription management policies and the network, um, sometimes called the landing zone, the, uh, the, the landing zone the application is going to land in. So this is something where the, the COE team can rapidly have an impact by, by helping to, to tighten up how, how these environments are, are created and managed. And then also work on the systems that your center of excellence team uses. So how does another team engage? How do they raise a ticket requesting a design review? How do they uh, obtain a new Azure subscription and so on? So, so work out what your ticketing system is, work out how those responsibilities work, work out your metrics by which you're going to be measuring your performance. So think about those systems that, that you're going to use and how you're going to, to roll those out across the organization. These are just some initial first steps. Obviously, you'd carry on a long way beyond this. In terms of the organizational model for a center of excellence team, this is another interesting challenge. Um, there's different approaches for this, and you'll have to look at your organization and how it's structured and the scale of your organization uh, in order to, to, to choose what's best for you. There's no one right answer here. So let's look at a couple of the different models. So the first model here on the left is, is to have a purely centralized team. So this is a separate, dedicated team. They have their own leader who is reporting up to senior management. Um, and this uh, this this team has a, a clear vision. It's they have a well-defined charter, a clear role, very clear accountability for the team. This is this is very positive, uh, you know, features of this centralized model. However, they are separate from the individual development teams, individual migration teams, and so on within the business units. And as a result, there can be some challenges here regarding engagement with those teams. Uh, so that those, those other teams may, I don't know, sometimes resent the presence of a COE team. If this is something they, they feel they've been working perfectly well without it, they, uh, they're having this imposed upon them. You need to make sure that they're seeing the value that the team is delivering and that they're, and that they're engaged in a positive way. And, uh, and also it can be a challenge because you, there may be a feeling that the COE, COE team, because it's not delivering projects hands on themselves, they may feel a little bit abstract or a little bit lacking in the real world uh, experience of, of, uh, of, of what needs to be done. They may be coming up with rules that are, that are felt to be impractical in, in practice. So it's important that your COE team in this model does stay deeply engaged with the, with the business units and that that is a two-way conversation. It's not just rules coming out from the COE team for others to adopt, but they're listening, they're seeing how they can help, they're seeing what the challenges are and that they understand the real world usage of the cloud and the, 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 the dirty real world problems that come with that so that they, uh, they, they stay grounded in how they are engaging. So this is a, the centralized model. Um, separately then, the, the decentralized model is where it's like a V-team model, where your COE is comprising um, key members from across your different business units, where maybe you take some of your cloud experts in different business units and you give them a, a part-time responsibility to, to be in this, this uh, V-team. Say, okay, you're going to spend 20% of your time in, in, this, in addition to your day-to-day -day duties. And this, of course, creates great engagement um, because now the COE we is deeply embedded within these other teams and it has a great real world in, in, insight for the same reasons it's embedded within these teams but it has the complementary cons compared to the central model so uh, so now of course these coe staff they have competing responsibilities. They have their COE responsibilities in, in addition to their day-to-day -day responsibilities. And it can be easy for the COE responsibilities to take a back seat because people are always busy. So, so that can be a challenge, you know, is getting the, getting the time and the mind share within the team. Um, and there can be lack of alignment as well. If you've got people coming from several different business units, they may have different priorities. Maybe one of them has more stringent compliance requirements than, than the other. One of them is uh, dealing with more complex networking issues than the other. So they can have different uh, alignment that can lead to, to conflicts within the team because uh, or a lack of alignment on priorities within the team. This can create all kinds of problems. And also there's a question mark around leadership here. You know, who is in charge of this team and how is that, uh, how is that balanced then across the business units? So there can be a, a, you know, some challenges around that. 
And then some organizations, they take a, a semi-centralized model. This is a combination of the two where you have a centralized team, you know, a core team that you then extend with a, an extended V team. So, uh, so you get, the, you get some of the benefits of, of both models. And if you can, if you can balance this, you can, you can generally have the benefits out, outweigh the cons. Um, but you may also get some of the cons coming in from both models as well. If you're, if you're, if you're not, not careful in how you set this up. So it's, so it's, it's a, it's a possibility, but it requires a little bit of balance to make sure that you are, uh, so you get the right it's in in this semi-centralized model um, in some cases you may see if you're a large organization with a global footprint you might have to think about how you do this from a global point of view some people they say okay we're going to have separate coe teams in each of our you know major geographic regions you know those teams can coordinate obviously and and share uh, best practices to some extent but largely they work autonomously and and you know the organization may be, may be of such a scale that that is the only practical approach um Many different approaches uh, uh, here. In terms of a strategy to move your COE team forward for success, uh, obviously we've talked already that leadership support, that visible support. You know, everyone has to know that this team is supported. That visible support from the leadership is is crucial. So, so you know, the CEO team they have to have the resources they need. They you know they need to have the budget they need. Let's be be, be plain speaking about that. And the rest of the organisation has to be clear about the role of the COE and where the COE is authoritative and what the responsibilities uh, of each. Are. So if there's ambiguity around this area, ambiguity around the charter, ambiguity around the around the relationships between the teams and their responsibilities, then you're on a path to trouble. So the COE team just cannot be successful in that environment. So it's very important to have that clear mandate, that clear charter and that clear, explicit leadership support. Um, with that in place, the COE team should absolutely aim for some quick wins, you know, get some small, high impact, high visibility workloads, build some confidence. It's building confidence within the team, but also within leadership across the organization. It's cre creating some visibility. It's creating some good news. It's a uh, it's a chance also to, to to learn some lessons, you know, get some of those teething pains out of the way and. Uh, and you know, set things up for moving forward to for bigger, more critical work. So, so get some quick wins. That's a very key, a key, a key step. Reusability. We talked already. You know, start building that library of reusable artifacts. Start being able to deliver value into the uh, the other projects. Not just in value in terms of the expertise and the and the advisory services, but those artifacts that let you deliver better and faster those artifacts that other teams can pick up and run with and it saves them doing it for themselves and it's uh, it's creating a uh, you know a virtuous cycle there where they can where they other teams can can benefit you know they you know they they they're getting that good news story about working with the coe team you know the value it's, it's a clear value prop that you're that you're offering to these other teams so 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 think about that side of it make sure those early investments that you make are strategic from this point of view they're reusable you're not investing all of your resources all your all of your times in in one-off projects that you're not going to get to to get that reuse benefit from because then you're you're not getting the scale multiplier that that, that you should be getting from a, a coe type investment and then once you've got that you know start looking at how you evangelize how you get the word out how you uh you know promote the team and the services across the uh, organization Think about, you know, setting up brown bags, you know, talks, lunchtime talks, whatever, uh, internal social media communications from leadership, you know, start making that bit of noise, promoting that visibility. Very important task for the lead of the team is to be able to get out there and, and, and get the team noticed and, and create that 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 traction, create the, uh, the clear message for the organization on how to engage and, and to get that traction with the organization. Start building the mindset. OK. Uh, let's talk a little bit. We've talked about reusability, so let's talk a little bit about that in more depth. So, reusable artifacts from your center of excellence team. So, um, there can be benefits here. You know, obviously, there's the efficiency piece we talked about, but also the quality. You know, you're by 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 using reusable, proven artifacts, and maybe when there's a bug that's found, it's fixed centrally for everyone to benefit. You can drive up the quality here. You know, it's a very important piece, and that of course reduces your risk and your rhyme saving. It says that should be time saving, obviously. Apologies for the typo on the slide so the time saving element there and the consistency the consistency shouldn't be underestimated especially for large organizations if you're handing 50 applications over to your operations team it's a 
huge benefit to them if these are set up in a consistent way with a similar naming convention, similar arrangements for how they're doing their networking, how they're doing their identity, how they're, how they're doing their deployments and so on, how their monitoring is configured. By having that consistency, you can create efficiency and you can also reduce mistakes. So very important benefit that's coming out of these artifacts that, you're, that we're talking about. When you think about your reusable artifacts, think about the full life cycle. Don't just think of them as, a, as kind of a static pool of resources. Who's writing them? How they're being published? How are they being discovered by the, by the client teams? How are you updating them? How are you versioning them? How are you tracing how they're being used? What metrics do you have on that? How do you make sure that uh, if people are, are people changing them? Are people undermining you by, uh, by, by taking best practices and, and changing them and maybe breaking some compliance requirements in the process? You know, how do you monitor that integrity of how things are being used? How are you measuring usage? And there are various tools available to help with this. And, uh, you know, that's something, you, you know, that's technical level you need to be thinking about these this this full life cycle of, of the artifacts and there's some examples on the right of the slide there of the type of thing that you might be that you might be using this is focused in the azure space but similar principles apply across the microsoft cloud so uh, so think about resource manager templates for deployment uh, blueprints as well for setting up environments uh, scripting with powershell or azure cli also uh, automation of common tasks with runbooks um, logic apps and functions again for as, as reusable components that uh, that people can can use for for specific uh, reusable tasks. Terraform is another form of uh, deployment model you can use. And then on the compliance side, you might think about role-based access control and Azure policy, so that you're implementing your 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 compliance in a consistent way, in a way that's very easy for other teams to pick up and run with. Um, there's a lot of talk from the moment of coming uh, from Microsoft in the world of landing zones, and this is a very common scenario. It's this kind of baseline environment environment that has all your compliance, maybe it's got identity, networking, built to a certain baseline that an application can simply land on top of. And this is a great idea that your that your center of excellence team owns your landing zones and the tooling in order to make deployment of landing zones and, and the monitoring of these landing zones uh, straightforward. So uh, Microsoft has been putting a lot of work into, into this. Uh, have a look in the cloud adoption framework, have a look at the Azure blog, there's been a post just recently, uh, you know, in this area. So uh, landing zones are a good topic to, uh, to, to focus on. Um, advisory services are another key service that the Center of Excellence offers. Obviously, we talked about that. Now, for all organizations, you can look at advisory services around reviewing initial project designs or helping to actually create an initial design. You know, maybe a ap new application that's coming along, you might work with your COE team on that on that design. If other people have been working on the design, then being able to provide um, advice on, on sticking points where they're stuck on how maybe a certain aspect should be implemented. Maybe they're, they're thinking about the database and they don't quite know which best, which approach is best or they're, or they're stuck thinking about how to do the monitoring and so on. So you can provide implementation advice. And then of course, when designs are in place, as part of your development lifecycle, you can have various gates there or opportunities to come in for a review, whether that's around the overall design, scalability, performance, cost efficiency, security, compliance, you name it. There's uh, many different aspects that you can use. Any of those uh, cloud fundamentals, best practices um, should be considered as part of a review like this. Um, sure that the overall architectures are are good for your for any projects that you're doing and then again if you're a partner and you're offering cloud-based services to your customers then the advisory services can extend into your pre-sales pre -sales phase so helping your pre-sales engineers with scoping and designing their applications maybe bringing an expert from the coe into a critical customer meeting can be useful uh, to add weight to the account team and also reviewing proposals making sure those proposals are are in line with the organization's existing artifacts, maybe you know, making best use of, of the existing artifacts, because that of course is an advantage in by leveraging your existing organizational IP. Maybe it's about reviewing the proposal from a cost point of view to make sure that it's uh, in, in line with, with uh, the experience that the COE team has in terms of cost management. So a lot of value that the COE team can bring to your proposals, enabling you to be more competitive and uh, avoid any any disasters uh, coming in underpriced or, or something on a on an offer. Um, it's always good with these engagements to aim to engage early. So uh, so make sure that the uh, the engagement comes as early as you can because if you're getting feedback from your COE team, if they're if they're asking for changes, the earlier in the process you are, the easier it is to implement those changes. If you're coming in late 
and you're doing this as a checkbox exercise towards the end of a project or when the design is really quite fixed and the cement has set, then you've got a problem. You're really not going to get the value out of the COE. It's become a box ticking exercise. Um, no one's going to be happy in that situation and you're not going to get the benefit. So, so make sure early engagement is a goal. And you may want to integrate that, as I've said earlier, into existing processes. Don't think of this as just a new process on top, but try and integrate it into the processes you have. OK, so governance, just moving to the end of this topic. So governance is a key topic here. And here we're not talking about the uh, subscription governance. We will have other talks on that. And, and we've talked about that a little already. But but what we're talking here is the actual COE team. What is the governance of this team from an executive point of view within the organization? So the key thing for the team here is that it's very important that they are able to demonstrate the impact of the COE team. That's the only way that they can ensure that they have sustained investment and that the organization can ensure that that value is coming from this team. So for that reason, a direct reporting relationship from the lead of the COE team up into senior leadership is, is, is essential. You know, you've got to have that. Don't bury the COE team down within the IT department somewhere. It's got to have some senior leadership uh, visibility and accountability. And there should be regular progress reviews. I don't know, maybe monthly reviews could be an option. Um, depends where you are. In the initial stages, obviously, they've been more frequent. Maybe once things are more steady state, they can be eased out a bit. But, uh, but regular reviews, and uh, they should make sure that they're an opportunity for the COE to, to demonstrate their value. And that can be through various metrics, which we'll talk about in a moment, and also case studies, you know, talk about the projects they've contributed to, to and, and what they did on those projects and how those projects have been have been better and faster and more secure and more reliable and more compliant because of the work the COE has been able to contribute. So, so, so tell those stories, tell the stories in those progress reviews. And also it's a chance to escalate any issues. You know, if their engagement isn't working in some ways, there's, a, there's you know, any challenges that you're having. It's an opportunity to make sure that those are visible and can get the the attention that they need. And in terms of in terms of metrics to to measure the progress of the of the COE, obviously you can you have to build these metrics around the different services that your COE offers. So we talked about the the uh, reusable artifacts the COE builds. You know the knowledge base. So there you can look at you know how much content has been published. How when was it? You know what are the refresh rates on that content? Is it up to date? And then what are the adoption rates by other teams for that content? For advisory services, you can look at you know how many requests are you receiving? How many have we completed? What types of those requests? What's the turnaround time on those requests? How many projects have you contributed to? Again, as, as well as the as well as the qualitative storytelling we talked about, you, you again have some some metrics that you can look at there. Pre-sales, if that's relevant, you can look at, you know, again, the pre-sale reviews you've ducted, you know, the case studies on the wins that you've had, um, talk about the uh, the proposals that you've been able to influence, look at the win ratio of projects that are coming through through with COE support. Um, on the training side, the readiness side, look at the training that the COE team has delivered directly and also the COE team has procured and look at the look at the training strategy, you know, work with the the HR or, or other skills teams to uh, to make sure that, you know, things are aligned and, and measure things like certifications to, to see that your organization is moving forward from a strategy point of view on, on cloud skills. And then on the governance side. Look at obviously uh, with the Azure policy, you get compliance reports. So you might look at uh, scorecards of, of how on a large scale your organization is meeting the, the policy compliance. Look at security center scores, for example, uh, it can be a good measure of, of overall uh, compliance with Azure best practices. Look at usage metrics, optimization metrics in terms of your Azure costs. And there's many reports available from Azure cost management to help with that. So make sure that that, uh, that governance piece uh, is, is showing up. The, the governance of subscriptions is showing up in your COE governance reviews. OK, and with that, uh, that brings me to the to the end of this uh, short presentation. So, you know, I would like to, to thank everyone for attending. You know, that's been that's been great. If there are if there are questions, then for those who are watching live, if you know, by all means, ask questions. We can hang around at the end for those. Um, for those watching the recording, obviously, uh, we'll probably edit this bit out. Um, so uh, thank you very much for attending. I hope you found it useful. Just to recap briefly, um, for instructor-led training, contact us at sales.opportunity.com. For Skill Me Up, for the online training, uh, again, across enterprises and individuals, uh, you can get a free trial at skillmeup.com. You also reach out to us there. And for virtual conferences, uh, contact us 
via govirtualconference.com for, for any requirements around virtual conferencing, especially in the current uh, COVID environment. With that, uh, thank you very much, and we'll wrap things up there. Thank you for listening.